Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, unnecessary, but still welcome. No, no. Um, so, uh, now how am I going for noise? Is this a bit close? Uh, yeah. Maybe, is that better? I think that's okay. <coughs> that's better? Uh, so, yeah, I never had to sign, or I never signed, I think, uh, programs before I gave a talk. So, uh, so, so that was an interesting new experience. Um, I'll be talking about, as you can see, uh, <coughs> about sustainability and, uh, and yeah, some of the underlying issues uh, and also some of the solutions which are associated with overcoming this problem. So I'll have uh, two segments to my lecture really and uh, the first one is just to outline the context of the problem for you and I won't spend too much time on it and then I like to offer two ways forward from a chemical point of view to address some of the issues. And the first one has to do with uh, what's called lignocellulosic processing, biomass processing, using renewable feedstocks uh, to do interesting things. And the second, maybe slightly surprising, is the processing of brown coal, of lignite, which of course everyone hates and is a terrible thing. But uh, if you do it in the right way, you can actually make a very positive contribution. And I should say I set up <coughs> uh, a couple of companies uh, on my way back to Australia. Oops, this is still. Uh, uh, when, when I came back to Australia, and uh, this technology is actually going to be transferred from the bench to the pilot plant and into a commercial demonstration plant. And we've done the pilot plant bit. And we're now going to go and show, uh, build a demonstration plants, demonstration plants of around 20,000 tons a year or so. So it's really Australian technology invented here, uh, hopefully going to uh, you know, overtake the world, but in a good way. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, what is sustainability? And if you just type it into Google, as most of my students do, and I guess you do as well, although I should say that most universities have lovely libraries and you might want to go and look at them as well from time to time. Um, there are many, many definitions. And the definition, one of the first ones, and I think one of the most comprehensive ones, is of the uh, UN, the Brundtland Report, which I guess you've heard in this session. Have people talked about this Brundtland Report? No? Well. If you go home, look at Google and type Brundtland report. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, and, um, and this was a commission set out to sort of try and define a framework for uh, how we can develop a sustainable way uh, uh, of, of using and interacting with the planet. And the way in which uh, the definition goes, maybe one of you likes to read it out. Do we have a brave person? There you go, brave person. Excellent. So, uh, so I think that's a really good, excellent reading as well, but it's an excellent, <laughs> excellent way of, uh, of, of summarizing what we need to do. <clears throat> but I will now try and point out that it's not that easy to actually achieve that. And also, it does not so easily connect to how people think. <clears throat> because I have a slightly different way on it. And, and people, if you look at history, People try and improve their situation, you know, at any time in their lives, right? People try and have a better life. And in order to do that, they do whatever they think they can get away with. <coughs> it's just how it is. So if my kids are not supposed to have another biscuit from the biscuit tin, but they think I'm not looking, they go for the biscuit tin. Equally, if there is a uh, CEO <coughs> of a multi-billion dollar company, he will go for some extra stock options or some extra compensation payment because he thinks he can get away with it. So it is sort of hardwired into our old brain. It goes right from childhood you know, all the way to adulthood. So I think we need to, in part, use that and not just be scared by it, but use it and, and, and don't say to people, well, this is how we all feel and think, but you now have to abandon it. You're not allowed to feel and think that way anymore. Well, I think there's a moderator that we can use. And that moderator is not just our 
you know, our instinctive feeling to get more and more stuff for ourselves. But there's also <coughs> the frontal lobe of your brain, right? Not the old part of your brain, but the frontal lobes of your brain, and that's where you have understanding. That's where you can think about things, you know. And once you think about things, you can enter, you know, ideas of ethics, of logic, and so forth. And the key is, once you understand with this part of your brain and not the instinctive old part of your brain that you can't get away with it anymore, then people will change. Why will they change? Because they want, uh, just for simple self-preservation reasons. So, so, so looking at it that way, uh, education is the most crucial part in this whole sustainability thing. Because if you educate people to say, to, to understand, they have to change what they're doing, and they understand the reasons for it, <clears throat> and there's of course a lot of denial about these things, and you just look in the newspapers every day, people just don't want to understand it, because they realize once they say, yes, you are right, <clears throat> we have to change something, then they are on a path they can't really get back from, uh, and, and they have to change, and there's always resistance to change. So, in my lecture, I'll do a little bit of education about uh, why we can't away with, get, get away with it anymore, and then, hopefully, and I'm sure you already are prepared to make some changes, and uh, I will then offer two paths for changes uh, that society can elect, <coughs> or not, as the case may be. So, first thing I'd like to discuss in terms of sustainability is the physical dimension. <coughs> Does everybody, is anybody aware of the footprint network? Yeah, there you go, I've got one. Uh, I encourage you to write down those two internet addresses, things, that one and that one. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to calculate the amount of resource you are using, your lifestyle is using. It translates it into a planetary surface area. Currently, well, currently, 2009, uh, it's the we are, we are exceeding the world's biocapacity by about 50%. So if we just keep on going as we are, it's about, we need about 1.5 planets. But of course, if I then look at how I live, because people in, uh, people in Africa, let's say, uh, uh, live a lot poorer life, uh, if, if I look at how I live, and I'm trying to do yeah, the right thing, but I, if everybody in the world lived like me, we would need about six to seven planets. So we clearly have a bit of a problem. And playing around with this and seeing what behavior makes what impact is a really good thing to get, your, get yourself thinking about how this all works. <coughs> Just to illustrate that, uh, that, that we are quite wasteful, this is a, a photograph, a satellite image, a collage of the world at night. And we see, oh, can we dim the lights a bit, maybe? Oh, just here. Can you do that, or even more, if you like? Uh, yeah, I'll, let's do one more and then see whether that's too dark. That's too dark, huh? So go back up. Thank you. There right. We you can all still read, yeah? Now this is the world at night, and whenever I show this slide in the United States, I obviously have to point out that this is a collage. Just because it is dark in the United States, it doesn't mean that it's dark at the rest of the planet. <coughs> but uh, be that as it may. Uh, <coughs> what you see is obviously a lot of cities, which are lit up, but then there are some other colors. So, what about this one? Does anybody know what that is? Very good. <coughs> Any Americans? No. Um, what about the red stuff? Sorry? Really bad light. Red light districts, major cities of the world. <coughs> That's right, it's a flaring. So, when you take oil, out of the ground, it's a little bit like Coca-Cola uh, or soda water. You have gases dissolved in the oil, 
And as it is depressurized, as it comes out, the gases are released. And what are you going to do with the gases? Now, lots of the gases are methane, which is much worse than CO2. So in remote locations, people are saying, well, it's better to burn it than to just push it into the atmosphere. However, Australia is, uh, does have some oil fields, <coughs> and the US has some oil fields. Any red around here? So does that mean we don't have any gas? What do we do with the gas? Do we just let it, you know, as Australians say, piss out into the atmosphere? Yeah. yeah. That would be the best, but often it's too remote to, to make that commercially sensible. <coughs> um, the be uh, 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 but there's another way, another thing to do. So? Yeah, make, um, click, click the methane to make hydrogen gas. Yeah, uh, processing would be great, but again, because of the long, the long distances and, and difficult accessibility, uh, some because the gas is not so energy dense, that, that is often a problem. Not always, but it's often a problem. Anybody else? Any idea? Use it to push the petroleum back out. Yeah, so, so re inject it. So you collect it and re-inject it into the well. That partially helps with additional oil recovery. You can think of the gas just pushing yeah, the oil out. So, so if you have a well here and a well there, you push it in and then it pushes the oil out. <coughs> or you just put it into an old, old well and, uh, and keep, it, keep it underground. Now, why are those countries doing it? Any idea? Very important point. One of the, oh, there we are, at the back. Is it cheaper than uh, Yes, but it's cheaper because of something special. Very important point. <clears throat> we have stable governments, well, reasonably anyway. They're going to go bankrupt there, but hey. You know. um, <clears throat> so reasonably stable governments here and here, although we've got a hung parliament, but it seems to work quite well. It allows us, it allows us to have legislation that is strong, and that's enforceable, and which can give rise to penalties, right? So that's where the cost comes from. <clears throat> and that legislation says you're not allowed to let it go into the atmosphere. You have to do something with it, and in the, you know, in the uh, ultimate case, you just re-inject it into your wells. So legislation changes the way the world looks from space, okay? So legislation is really important tool to enhance sustainability, right? Yeah, good question. Uh, oh, this, the, the, that one? Uh, I have to admit, not entirely sure. Not entirely sure. Um, these are, uh, 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 it could be that the flame temperature is slightly different <coughs> because these are composite image with, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. What's the green between China and Japan? What, uh, that bit there. So, so any, any idea, what's green and what's in the sea? And what grows in polluted waters? Right, so what you see is huge algae blooms from space due to the uh, pollution. Now, that also shows you something, and that is if you want to clean up pollution, Use algae. And algae obviously also sequesters CO2, so that's not too bad a, too bad a, uh, a combination. <clears throat> so my point is we're quite wasteful. My point is legislation can really change the world. And so we need to be able to make sure that the people who do uh, come up with legislation, politicians and lawyers and whoever else, have got good information to make decisions from, to base their decisions on. So we need a highly educated political class and a highly educated uh, administration class. <coughs> and, and, and that's all of our role in general society to make sure that these people know what they're talking about, that they know the implications. And maybe some of you will become you know, a prime minister or a head of a department somewhere. <coughs> so, so, so then, of course, your strong science background will help that quality of decision as well. Right. 
Another example of how much we are wasting, or how wasteful we are, I should say. <coughs> this is global air traffic movement over one day. Each dot is an aeroplane. This goes for an hour, uh, this goes for an hour. This goes for a minute and 20 seconds. And normally I don't play something that long, but I think it's so impressive and opens up so many questions that it is worthwhile having a quick look. So every dot is an individual aeroplane in 2008. This was done in Switzerland, so they were extremely accurate about it all. <laughs> so you can see the shadow moving across the earth, and you can see how the different planes move from one spot to the other. So Europe is getting rather busy. And now you can see Europe going all the way back to the States. Now the States is pretty busy and Europe is starting to get a bit, a bit quieter now. <clears throat> well, as you can see, it's a heck of a lot of airplane movement and a lot of things, you know, one needs to think about, is this really necessary, huh? Do we really need roses from Nigeria on the same day? Do, and when mangoes are not in season, do we really need to have them from Kenya? Is that necessary, given we are resource constrained? Just some, you know, some pause for thought. I just, you know, a student of mine sent me this uh, after I gave one of these talks and I thought it was worthwhile sharing. Right, <clears throat> so that was the physical dimension. But then we also have something else, the moral dimension. And that's effectively where a lot of trouble comes from. Because the United Nations Charter of Human Rights has some, you know, some good points. So. Uh, somebody would like to read the preamble? Anybody? Yeah, you're right. Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Excellent, and I think we can all agree with that, right? That's a really good statement. And uh, Article 25, somebody? Right, so I think again we can all agree with that, yeah? But we now have a problem. And what's the problem? The problem is <coughs> we have a geopolitical mismatch. On the one hand, we haven't got enough stuff. I told you if everybody lived like me, which is I guess what the human United Nations Charter is looking for, we need six to seven planets. Haven't got enough stuff. On the other hand, we want everybody to have a, fair, a good life. So how do we deal with that? And what you see on the, televisions, uh, in the television in the evening, you know, the various political things and wars and whatever are a direct consequence of that tension. So that is a real issue. The climate angle is just one aspect of the resources. <clears throat> so the climate is just one aspect, right? The, the, the resource of the, of, the, of, the, of the atmosphere, what the atmosphere can do. But there are lots of other areas as well. So the resource supply issue, the resource availability, that's something we have to, sorry, that's something we have to uh, come to terms with. So the question then is, you know, what are we going to do about it? So I have a hypothesis in this lecture, and that is that <coughs> science and engineering give the primary means for the societal changes which are necessary. Now, you can't expect a lawyer or a, or a politician to say, well, we stop 
this particular form of electricity generation and we have this new one which is much better and I invent it in my spare time. They're not going to be able to do that. So the societal uh, processes, the economic ones, the political ones, the behavioral changes, they need to be enabled by being able to change towards something, being able to achieve, to, to, to go in a new direction. And <clears throat> that new direction can be, of course, how you organize society, and that's where, you know, that's where the, uh, 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 that's where the liberal arts type, type subjects come in. But at the end of the day, we all need to be closed, fed, you know, warm, like it's day like today, and that's sciencey. Can't we organize society? Well, we can all huddle together and uh, not be so cold. <clears throat> but for that, you need science and engineering. So, <clears throat> so that's why it is so incredibly important to, uh, to, to, to fund science and engineering and come up with the solutions for the future to relieve some of that tension between our ambitions for our fellow man and woman uh, and, and, and the reality of living on one planet. And that is just a big, big tension. <clears throat> and going back to the way we used to do it would work if we didn't have this massive population that we do. So if we went back to a population of a billion people or half a billion people, yeah, we can do organic farming, we can do all sorts of things, you know. <clears throat> we might die a bit earlier if we don't have pharmaceuticals, but hey, you know, we can do that. Uh, but that back to fundamentals approach doesn't work for a population of 6 billion going on to 9 billion. The, the, what will happen is that lots and lots of people will die of starvation and illness and, 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 and potentially war. Now that's not what we want. So we would like to come up with solutions which work in tandem between science and engineering and the various societal forces. That's the key concept. You've got to do both. <clears throat> and I've tried to, to translate some solutions and I found out that the effort to get it accepted and implemented by society, 10% is actually coming up with the science and engineering solution and 90% is getting it actually into, into the world, into society. So there's a big, big effort there that needs to be done as well. So just having a better mousetrap doesn't guarantee anything. Right. <coughs> now, I'm a, a catalytic chemist. That means I like to make chemical reactions go faster. Does everybody know what a catalyst is? Yeah, more or less? OK, so I'll keep this very brief then. So it enhances the rate at which a chemical equilibrium is being attained, right, by reducing the activation energy, energy barrier for a reaction to occur, right? Two molecules surrounded by electron clouds, they come together, electron clouds are negatively charged. As they come together, they actually increase the energy of the system, they don't really like it, so you've got to give them a kick to get through that hump, and then when they're close enough, the clouds merge and a new bond is formed and off you go. That's what a catalyst does. It helps to reduce the energy involved in that coming together when they really don't want to come together because of the repulsion. The catalyst gives a different path. So <coughs> what I can do then in a complex system, I can select out of 10 reaction, reactions, just one reaction to, uh, uh, to be accelerated. So I can change the selectivity of a chemical system very dramatically. And uh, the catalyst, of course, by definition, is unchanged in the overall process. So if, if let's say, do you yeah, have these two things? So this is molecule one and molecule two. This is a catalytic surface. They both come onto the surface. The electron cloud smears out. They come and react. They move towards each other. They, they then react, uh, facilitate, facilitated by the surface, and then it leaves and the surface is as it was before, right? That's what a catalyst does. It's not part, it's not a, it's not a substrate in the, in the reaction itself. It's not consumed. Just to give you an idea of the power of catalysts <coughs> to illustrate the phenomenon, um, I, I show you an enzyme called, you know, uh, 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 imaginatively catalase, uh, and we all have that enzyme. We all have, you know, billions of enzymes in our bodies. That's what makes all the reactions actually occur in our body to a large extent. 
and that makes them occur selectively. So without enzymes, without catalysts, we all be instantaneously dead. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is, uh, is uh, ground-up liver, ground-up liver, which has, got this, uh, which has got this enzyme in it, catalase, and a little bit of blood. And uh, <clears throat> on this other side, we have a glass of uh, uh, um, hydrogen peroxide and water. Now, this is stuff you go to the pharmacist to bleach your hair if you're so inclined. Uh, or put on, your, put on your wound or something like that. Now, as you can see, well, as you will see, this is perfectly stable. Can we calm down a bit? I just get distracted. I'm very easily distracted. I think what you're saying is probably a lot more interesting than what I'm saying, and then I'm wanting to listen. So, uh, <coughs> so this is going to be perfectly, st this is perfectly stable. Nothing happens. Here's the catalyst, but what the catalyst will do, it will catalyze its decomposition. And it will do that at a rate of 100 million molecules per catalytic site per second. So that's quite a lot, if you think about it, right? One second, one, 100 million molecules. So they're moving about rather quickly. So um, let's see what happens. So I got the blood which for religious reasons is chicken blood, I think. Ah, thank you very much. <coughs> so what happens is the blood gets, uh, the, the, the blood curdles uh, uh, and, and traps the gases which are evolving because, and this is part of the bleach which did not get decomposed and is bleaching the blood as it comes up. Okay? Do we want to see it again? Yes. <laughs> if this works out, hang on. Oh, there we are. Yeah. So very stable, very stable. Here's the blood, nothing happens. And it's only the action of the enzyme, although I don't think there's anything happening on my video. <laughs> we could do this again. Yeah, go, yeah, I might have to do that. Okay, let's see. Bang. So, so you can see catalysts can react, can, can, can allow chemical reactions to be accelerated you know, just tremendously. Right? Now there's another little piece of information that is in this slide. And that is you now know where that really cheap strawberry and vanilla ice cream comes from in the supermarket. On that bombshell. <coughs> so this is the education part in terms of the problem over. Now I'd like to offer two ways forward. Yeah, how can we go, how can we go and, and, and come up with some solutions? So first one is biomass, uh, <coughs> biomass processing. And as you can see here, we have uh, we have here time and there the amount of stuff. And as you can see, as time increases, normal diesel and gasoline is decreasing in availability. But we are projected to use more and more stuff. And then we have no way of doing that except fill in a little triangle. And that says, oh yeah, that's no problem. Synthetic and biofuels. Right. Well. That bit, they are fossil fuels, but the other little triangle I like to call the fuels that we don't really have. We don't really, you know, it's not really there yet. <clears throat> but as you can see, timeline-wise, we've got to get pretty quick smart to actually develop them. And one way is, of course, to take gas and make gas into liquid fuels, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But I think biofuels also have a big role to play. Now, why do we have such problems you know, with, the, with the fuels? You know? Why do we need so much fuel? It starts very early in life, this problem, as you can see here. See, this is a, uh, this is a, um, a scan of a, of a little baby in the mother's 
in the mother's tummy. And let's see what that little baby is doing, even before it's born. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, as you can see. I like particularly when he takes, you know, the cigarette out of his mouth and throws it out of the window before he starts going. So, so clearly, you know, we, oh, hang on, hang on. Yeah, all right, that wasn't supposed to happen, but. Right, done. I'll go to the next slide. <coughs> so, uh, so that was just a bit of a joke, but I mean, we do have a love of fuels, we do have a love of getting around ourselves uh, by car, by motorbike, by aeroplane. So, so, so it is, it is, you know, our lifestyle choices which have a lot to do with that. Um, so, what are the fuel options that we have? Uh, you know, wh where can we go and use biomass sensibly? For stationary power, we have other alternatives. We've got hydroelectric. We've got nuclear, we've got solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, wave, all sorts of things. So <clears throat> it is, in my view, a silly thing to do, although it's very easy to do, uh, to use biomass to, to generate power. There are other alternatives, and there's not so much biomass. Road, rail, and mining. Is that a good area? Well, <clears throat> there we have gas that could do it in many cases. Uh, a hydrogen, special gas, uh, and, uh, and of course a lot of the road transport will be, will be done by electricity, which can be centrally generated, and, and, and again, there are lots of alternatives to using biofuels uh, for that sector. Aviation. Are there alternatives in aviation? And uh, well, I think in aviation we all know that gaseous fuels are pretty much unacceptable. And this is the, any, I guess you are all too young, aren't you? Anybody knows what that's called? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. You're young and clever. You watch Discovery Channel or something, yeah? <clears throat> um, there's a conspiracy theory, I'm sure, on Discovery Channel about how some alien actually, actually uh, ha, you know, was responsible for this. <coughs> um, so gaseous fuels are unacceptable. Um, and, and also, you know, if, if I could go to London from here with that sort of setup, basically a big hydrogen cylinder with an aeroplane on top, or a hydrogen cylinder with some, you know, with some seats and some wings, although it might be really exciting and very fast, I'll probably start to think about failure rates, you know, statistics, and I don't think there is any way the public would accept it. So gaseous fuels are out. What about batteries? Well, currently, the best battery has a power density, so the amount of oomph per weight, uh, of 0.9 megajoules a kilogram. <coughs> That's not a lot. Uh, organic fuel, Jet A, has got 43 megajoules per kilogram. Right? That's why you have the big trucks and you have a reasonably small tank and it goes and goes for 400 kilometers. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy in, uh, in, in, in organic fuels. So even if today's batteries were better by a factor of 10, which I think is theoretically impossible, I'm not the physicist, but I think, uh, uh, it would be 9 megajoules per kilogram. So still way off the 43 megajoules per kilogram. So aviation fuels don't really have an alternative, right? You heard it here first. Aeroplanes will never fly on batteries, and, um, and, and, and we really need liquid organic fuels because you need to have the highest power density possible. <clears throat> Somebody once suggested, well, why don't we use a nuclear reactor? <sighs> well, you know, uh, I think there are some safety issues and general acceptability problems. So now I'm all excited about biofuels and about oil and bio-oil and whatever. But how much can I actually make? You know, this is a back of an envelope calculation that, that any of you could do. 
So if you have a look at the world oil consumption, it's 1,125 barrels a second. <coughs> now, how much is that? Anybody, any idea? Just to give you an idea, you know these Victorian terraces that we have in, in Sydney. You've probably seen some of those with the wrought iron. They usually have a front yard. And usually the front yard is something like five meters deep, seven meters wide, and let's just say the house is seven meters high. And if you have that box of volume, every second, that's how much oil we use worldwide, every second. So we use quite a lot of oil. <clears throat> now, if I then say, well, how much, how much yeah, biomass do actually grow agriculturally and so forth? That's, depending which website one looks at, it's about nine gigatons per year. Nine gigatons per annum. Now, if I say, okay, I'll take my biomass and I'll make 40% hydrocarbon out of it. That's really generous because half, close to half of your biomass is oxygen. So you've got to remove that, right? So <clears throat> if I say I remove half of the weight of my biomass, the dead oxygen doesn't do anything, then I have 50% left and then it'll cost me something to remove it as CO2 and as a bit of water. So let's say I'd take another 10% to do that. <clears throat> so, so 40%. Well, if I then say, What's the world energy consumption in gigatons per year? That many? Divide that by 0.4 to get the conversion. Then, in fact, I need 13 gigatons per year of biomass to supply all the world's oil use at this moment. Well, that's clearly impossible. It's stupid. So anybody saying things like that has obviously not done extremely simple mathematics divide something by 0.4. <coughs> so, so therefore, biomass is quite a scarce resource and we need to use it carefully if we want to use it at all for fuel. And I think there's a good reason why we should. <coughs> if I now look at the world aviation fuel consumption, that has got a lot lower footprint, 47 barrels per second. So all those aeroplanes you saw, right? That's equivalent of 46, uh, 56 barrels per second. And that <coughs> corresponds, as percentage of agricultural production, to sort of, you know, seven, eight, nine, whatever, percent. And I can imagine that. I can imagine that I've got forestry waste streams, agricultural waste streams, algae, all sorts of things that might, might make that. So get, therefore, the combination that Aeroplanes don't have an alternative. They need to use liquid organic fuels. And that their demand more or less matches with the biocapacity that we can dream about of our planet. I think that's a really good match. And in most of the areas uh, of biofuels now, the companies pushing most strongly are all the air, 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 aircraft manufacturers and the airlines, because they've realized this as well. They want to get their hands on as much biomass, as much biofuel as possible before other people do. So, um, <clears throat> so in terms of sustainability, that's a strategic consideration. <clears throat> and it's still quite a lot. You know, it only says 7.8%, but it corresponds to processing 2 million tons worldwide per day and at 500,000 tons per annum. That's a sensible size you can collect because that's always an issue with biomass because so much is oxygen, so much is dead, dead weight, you can't collect it from a very long distance. Usually it's about 50 kilometers from where you process. After that, you're just transporting water effectively. So, so it's just the yeah, economics don't work anymore. So <clears throat> the 500,000 tons per annum is more or less the figure people use. So it needs 1,400 bio-crude or bio-oil plants uh, to just service the aviation industry, which is a lot. You know, one of them will cost you, depending on what technology you use, between half a, half a billion and a billion. So it's a big investment and it's a big time scale. So even doing it for the aviation industry is it's, yeah, it's a big challenge. But I think that's something we can actually achieve. I think we can make in the next 
you know, 15, 20 years, we can make all of the aviation industry carbon neutral. I think that's, that's it's entirely feasible. So, so there's some positive message, right? Some hope in terms of what we can do. <coughs> so just a quick, although I'm running a bit late, uh, quick one on biofuel distribution. I think there's three scenarios. Currently, it's all uh, the oxygenates, the ethanols eh, for cars and the biodiesel first generation. <coughs> That's going into cars, and into mining. But that will very quickly change into refinable bio-crude oils and we get perfect hydrocarbons, so-called drop-in fuels. They go again into cars and things, <coughs> but also in aer into aeroplanes. And after some time, all of this red will become blue. It will all be aviation fuel. And the stable situation will be a mixture, in my view, of ethanol and of, uh, of drop-in aviation fuel. And the only reason the ethanol is still there is because uh, Brazil, the sugarcane, has an incredibly effective way of being able to make ethanol. Why? Because they have two growing seasons in one year. So therefore, the economics are so good that they can do something which I think is actually not so clever. Uh, they can do it so cheaply that it is, uh, that it is possible. And by the way, they do not, uh, they do not uh, slash burn rainforests for that. The sugar cane doesn't grow in those areas all that well. They're, they grow further south. I always thought it was rainforest stuff, but it's actually not. I just thought I'd point it out. <coughs> so currently, people are using bioethanol. Uh, a lot, and I'll just go very quickly through, through some chemistry. Um, that's uh, that's uh, making ethanol by fermentation of sugars and starches, like you make beer and wine. <coughs> but there's issues with that. We have insufficient raw material. We compete with food. And overall, you need a lot of energy to do this in the first place. So then, uh, 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 so all of these first generation fuels have got these food versus fuel issues, so biodiesel and bioethanol because you can eat your feedstock. <coughs> so lignocellulosics uh, are slightly different. I might take that if that's all right. Um, so, star so, so fibrous stuff, right? Stuff that you, that you can't digest so easily, bits of wood and whatever. Why don't we use that? And what are lignocellulosics? Do you have an understanding of these things or not? Not so much? A bit? <coughs> so what we've got is uh, lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. What are celluloses? That's your paper, right? And that's basically polymerized sugar. So we can make sugar from trees. So your wood, the wood that you see here, 70% of it is sugar, just in a special form. So if we can liberate the sugar, we can do the fermentation and so forth. <coughs> Here are some chemical structures of the lignin. You can see it's very much a petrochemical, lots of aromatic rings. And uh, here we see sugar chains uh, linked together into the cellulose. And here we have a slightly uh, more explicit picture so one of those rings, <coughs> one of those rings here, is a sugar ring, and they are linked together, and um, there are three-dimensional models of this, and then they are linked together in chains, which have hydrogen bonding in between the chains, so you get a crystal, and then you get the, the hard, the hard wood. So there are other things than, 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 than wood. We can also use, uh, we can also use uh, grasses, uh, for example. Uh, banner grass is a good one. It's a windbreak in Queensland. So after burning it, two weeks after burning it, it's already a bit green. Two months later, it's a bit greener. And then four months later, you can see, wow, this has really, uh, really come up a lot. So very fast-growing energy crops, which are not competing with food and so forth, uh, uh, these are used, as I said, as windbreaks, so they're already, uh, 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 they're already <coughs> established. Uh, another exciting thing is algae. You may remember the Beijing Olympics, where people are where, where practicing their sailing, and there was an algae bloom, and that's what it looked like. 
The advantage is with algae, they grow 10 times faster than anything else. Macroalgae, they easily, easily harvest it. And sometimes we get sort of heroic people harvesting it as well. So. <coughs> but in fact, if you look very carefully, he got lost, right? This guy got lost, and he's desperately trying to look on his iPhone, Google Maps, where he is. Oh, you can't really see it on this picture, but on here you can see it very nicely. So what we can do is then we can make ethanol from sugar liberated from the lignocellulosics. And that's the paper and pulping approach. <coughs> we can take the lignin away in a pulping step. So we take that coat I showed you, it goes away with nasty chemicals. Uh, but we have environmental issues in the Tama Valley in Australia has had all that discussion. <coughs> but then once we have made the, 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 the cellulose, so the pulp, we've got to cut that into pieces to get the individual sugar units. Now, the enzymes that do that get poisoned by the leftovers from the lignin removal process. Big problem. <coughs> now, once I've done all of that and I've you know, not killed my enzymes, uh, then we have C6 sugars, which is what you have in your coffee, but also we have C5 sugars. And there are currently no commercial fermentation organisms that allow ethanol co uh, conversion from C5 to, sorry, for, from C5 sugars. Now, <clears throat> the US is spending a billion dollars on trying to solve it. $500 million from government uh, and $500 million matching from industry. And I think it's really the wrong route. It's a really silly thing to do. And I'll explain to you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> what are the two principal goals when I refine my biomass? Really simple. One, reduce the oxygen content, right? Because you can't burn oxygen, so you want to take the oxygen out. <clears throat> and secondly, you want to keep the same or increase the hydrogen content, because hydrogen in your fuel gives you a lot of power. That's what you want to do. And if you think ethanol, carbon, carbon, oxygen, well, that's a, not a great ratio, is it, if you want to get rid of oxygen. One oxygen for every two carbons. So inherently, it's maybe not such a good goal to have. <coughs> so what did nature do? <coughs> well, it deoxygenated over a long period of time through geological processes. So this is the first oil well ever. And here behind, you see coal. So highly deoxygenated ancient forest, right? Squished and a lot of gases evolving over millions, hundreds of millions of years. <coughs> Humans try to do the same. Charcoal, right, is a way of doing it. And uh, in the Bronze Age, they made charcoal to melt iron ores and go to war and things. <coughs> About, yeah, resource availability. Or Helen of Troy, I mean, I guess in a resource of a different type. Um, <coughs> So, so, so humans have been trying this, and then they've taken it further and said, well, let's gasify the coal. Town gas from coal, that's about 130, 140 years old. Lots of old movies, you see this stuff. So we've been there, done that. We know how to do that. And then two Germans came along, Professor Franz Fischer and Dr. Hans Tropsch. And as you can see, they're very serious people. But in their free time, actually, there were a comedy duo called uh, Franz and Hans. <coughs> um, <laughs> uh, and they worked out that uh, you can take the gas that you make, the syn gas, and make it into diesel in one step with Carl Fischer Tropp's chemistry. So <coughs> that's the Germans did that in the 30s and uh, overcame the uh, uh, oil embargo for reasons I guess we all know. Uh, and South Africa, also Cecil, did a lot of that work later on for similar reasons. And these are modern plants of that type. Now, why don't we do that with biomass? Take the biomass, just like coal, gasify it, Fischer Tropsch chemistry, get your diesel. Perfect. What's the problem? <coughs> well, it works well. And there's a German company who's actually done it in combination with Shell. And you know, everybody was very happy. But then Shell pulled out after five years because they realized the Fischer-Tropsch part will never make it at scale. 
and there are a number of engineering reasons, you need very large scale for the economics to work because the reaction is slow. That means your entry barrier is at least four to six billion dollars. That size of plant is incompatible with the ability to collect my biomass in a commercially sustainable way because I have to get too much biomass in. And, you know, I'm sure at some board meeting somebody pointed this out and somebody went, oops, because that's a back of an envelope c calculation, right? This is something you can work out in three lines of mathematics that, hey, this will actually never work. Oops. How many hundreds of millions did we spend on this? Damn. Anyway, but then the oil price rose and Shell did okay again. You know. <coughs> but corn is still trying. Another way of doing it is pyrolysis. That's like gasification, but you don't take all of your material into the gas phase. You stop while it is in a sort of tarry phase and you make a pyrolysis oil. Those oils have really high oxygen contents. I mean, you start off with 45% oxygen in your biomass. These oils are around, the best ones are around 30, 35% oxygen. Sometimes they're even 40% oxygen. So you're not really gaining anything other than it's a liquid. But <coughs> they are not a liquid for long. They become a Bakelite type material very quickly because they're so active with all the oxygens and double bonds. What happens if there's an oxygen next to a double bond? What happens to the double bond? It is. Yeah, it's polarized, that's right. And that means it's activated. And that means if there's another double bond next to it, or opposite it, <coughs> then it really likes that electron density of the other double bond. And they react together, and they cross-link, and they polymerize. So double bonds and oxygen means by Bakelite. And you don't want that if you want to refine something, yeah? So those oils have got a lot of trouble. <coughs> so what have I said? Gasification followed by Fischer-Tropsch works. <coughs> the capital expenditure is in the billions, incompatible with the collection radius. Expensive energy-wise. Pyrolysis followed by, you can take all the oxygen out with hydrogen. That's not a problem. Well, it is a problem, actually. Uh, <coughs> so well, here I was very generous. It's actually much worse now. I talked to Dynamotive, who've, who are the biggest in the field, and they've owned up that they never get 20%. Uh, so highly high oxygen unstable oils and a lot of hydrogen to take all the oxygen out as water with hydrogen, right? And again, you need to have a, a steam reformer, methane to hydrogen, that capex-wise is at least a billion dollars. Again, the scale doesn't quite compare with what you can collect. So the problems again. So I said to you, oh, and of course, because of the high oxygen content, there are no commercial catalysts available that can actually do this to the pyrolysis oil. So even if I did have the hydrogen, and I could, take, I could not take all the oxygen out with a commercial catalyst. So I basically said to you, hey, let's use it for aviation fuel. And then I'm saying to you, well, hey, actually we can't do it. Which is not really you know, a great message, is it? So <clears throat> here, let's, let's let me give you a better message. Ah, before I do that, just to, you know, sort of summarize the dilemma. We've got biomass, and uh, <coughs> that has, with nature, has gone over hundreds of millions of years into coal and into oil, right? And then we had about 150 years to learn how to refine the coal and the oil into all the products we see around us. And we can't really get away from these products because our whole economies are built on these building blocks in the center here. <coughs> so what do we need to do? We need to have from the biorefinery side uh, elements which, go, which, which also allow us to get these building blocks. Okay? And we need to take this from biomass, as you can see here. Now what's the big difference? Well, nature had, on average, three to four hundred million years to get the biomass into the right shape. And then we had 150 years to learn how to process it. To make an impact, we would like to go from here to here in about half an hour, different time scale to 300 million years, <coughs> from here to here in half an hour. And to learn how to do it, to make a sensible impact, we really have about 10 years. 
you know, then we really need to have done it. Otherwise, we're not going to have a big impact on, 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 the, whole, on, on the whole side of things. So, um, so there are challenges. <clears throat> so one of the ways of solving the challenge is to do what Ignite Energy Resources, which is a company that I've uh, set up, is doing. So they have a two-step process. Now, I've now done my hour, haven't I, where are we? So, That's okay. Yeah? <coughs> right, so, so what I'll do is I'll rush through this a little bit, and then we can have a discussion afterwards, and I can fill, fill in, yeah? So what we have is a two-step process. We first take our biomass and make it into a crude oil, and then <coughs> we take the oxygen out with uh, what's called conventional hydro-treating and with conventional catalysts. So what we do is we take either uh, 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 biomass or, as you can see at the bottom here, brown coal, low value, high oxygen materials, they're wet, they're terrible. <coughs> but then we add supercritical water, which is the fourth state of matter. And I'll explain to you in a moment what that is. We basically boil it up, and once we've boiled it up, we have a high value, low oxygen product. From the biomass, we make bio oil, which is refinable. And from the brown coal, we make a coal oil and black coal, which is very high energy density, has a very high energy density. <coughs> so what is supercritical water? Well, basically, you can see here on this graph, you have, you know, ice, you've got liquid water, you've got steam depending on temperature and pressure. But then there's the fourth state of matter, supercritical. That's effectively gas that is so strongly compressed, it works like a liquid to be able to dissolve things, but <coughs> it has a diffusion rates and so forth of a gas. So um, it's very special. It also changes the way the water behaves. It can now dissolve oil and all sorts of things. So here you can see water and, water and oil in an autoclave, and as I change the phase to supercritical, the water and oil mix perfectly well. So by enough pressure and temperature, we get that mixture. <coughs> Here you can see a piece of wood that, uh, that is in the, um, you know, take a drink. <coughs> Talking about water, you know. Uh, a piece of wood that is inside of water. And under these conditions, after a few minutes, you see the piece of wood is entirely gone. And what we have is a little bit of uh, bio oil uh, separate and a little bit of other bio oil dissolved in the water. But virtually no, no wood is left. Just a little bit of ash at the bottom. <clears throat> so that means all the benches that you're sitting on, we can cook in hot water and make into oil. So, just to illustrate again, wood shavings, our process, <coughs> and we get bio-crude oil. Now, that amount of bio-crude oil has the same energy density as those wood shavings. And as you can see, we have different types of, different types of feedstocks. So, we need low oxygen content and high hydrogen content. Uh, we need high stability, and we need good conversion. And I was going to do some chemistry, but I think it's probably getting a bit tight. So the question is, what is the basic chemistry? Very feedstock dependent. You can't mix the feedstocks. But here are some of the main reactions. Hydrolysis, adding water. Dehydration, taking water out again. Oxidation. Decarbonylation is an important one. So you remove CO. That's one way of removing oxygen. Decarboxylation, remove CO2, <coughs> and then some other things. Uh, um, the key is we have cascades of, of reactions, and we are able to tune them with catalysts. That's really all you need to know on this part. So an example is we have 1,000 kilograms <coughs> of oil, oh, sorry, of biomass on a dry and ash-free basis, and we make about half of that into a liquid. And the key point is, we remove from one step 82% of the oxygen. So, just in case you've forgotten. <coughs> uh, 
here you can see um, percentage oxygen versus energy density. So in one step, we go very close to conventional hydrocarbons. <coughs> um, this is about the technology. We can see that, that we have the lowest oxygen content in, in a very short period of time compared to competing technologies of enzymes, the fermentation side, or of pyrolysis. <coughs> and we can do the same for lignite, for brown coal. As you can see here, we have even more oxygen because the lignite is very, very wet when you, when you mine it. <coughs> and here, out of a thousand kilograms of lignite, we generate uh, a fair amount, of, uh, fair amount of oil, about 250 kilograms, as well as a lot of black coal, 550 kilograms. And the key, again, is that we retain of the combustible materials 90% of our feedstock. So 90% stays in there and is ready to use. And that's a real differentiator from any other coal upgrading technology. What does that mean? What does you know, 32 megajoules per kilogram of, black, of, of, of upgraded lignite coal mean? <coughs> well, it allows power stations to reduce their emissions uh, for the same amount of electricity generated by about 40%. And if that's the case, let's have a look what's happening globally. Globally, about one billion tons of brown coal is used every year. <coughs> if I then reduce that usage, if I keep the amount of electricity generated the same, that relates to a reduction of one billion tons of CO2 a year. And Australia's total emissions are about 330,000, uh, sorry, 330 million tons a year. So. With just this technology switch worldwide, I can save Australia's total emissions three times over. Now, it's still using coal, and we maybe want to get away from that in the long term, fossil fuels, but in terms of people are doing it right now, people are building power stations right now, we can't turn that big ship around right now, but we can make them build a different boiler, which can cope with our coal. And therefore, we can make a very short-term, high impact. And that's why I think this is still worthwhile doing. <coughs> what does it mean for Australia? If all the Australian power stations were using our technology, it would reduce the overall emissions of Australia by 15%. So <coughs> that's, you know, I think substantial, given that the aim here is 5% by legislation. <coughs> so again, that's a, that's a B. Now you can uh, hydro process this uh, crude oil rather nicely. And you can make beautiful aviation fuel from the coal oil. And you can see here, it's shitty oil to start off with. And after adding hydrogen, uh, you make beautiful aviation fuel that's uh, ultra low sulfur and so forth. And we make about 0.8 barrels of oil from the brown coal. Now, is that important? This is, an, uh, this is a slide that shows you where the oil sits. So I've got another. Three slides, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this is where all the oil sits in the world. So you can see the Middle East has by far the largest amount of oil. Now, whether that is related to what you see in the evening news, in Libya and Iraq and all that, I don't know. I'm just saying it might be. But, you know, I haven't yet made up my mind. But the Middle East is clearly an important place in our world for many reasons, religious ones, but also, I think, because of the oil. So the rest of the world doesn't really have enough oil to do what it wants to do. If I now were to take our technology and make oil from the brown coal and <coughs> dial that in to the system, you see that the Middle East suddenly becomes not so important anymore. And uh, given that you know the United States is uh, paying between three and five billion dollars a week uh, for the war, and they have done so for 10 years, it's a fair few billion. Now, if they had invested that money into technology like ours, they would be completely independent of foreign oil. And I wonder whether they would be then in those scenarios, in those theaters of war. And, you know, <clears throat> so, so these technologies can have 
global implications also on the political side, because if you are able to, to take that, that tension between resource supply and what you want to do with the resource away a little bit, that can have really seismic shifts, result in seismic shifts in what goes on in the world. <coughs> um, I talked to, uh, to the German Chancellor about this, and she was very enthusiastic, and we're going to put one demonstration plant into Germany. So it's a little bit, you know, selling brown coal and biomass technology to Germany, it's a bit like selling, selling you know, snow to the Eskimos, but I think we're, we're going to be there. Does anybody speak German? So you can, you can enjoy or not that little, that little joke there. What it says is quite simply uh, that uh, the German press agency and Reuters announce you know, the latest news, that the German double chin is back in fashion. So you can have a look there, you can have a look there. <laughs> so that's really what unites Angela and myself, you know. It's our propensity for the double chin. So, uh, so uh, she used to be a physical chemist, by the way. She was a professor, she was a senior lecturer uh, uh, at, at, uh, in East Germany. And she was a PhD student, of course, at some stage in her life. She married her then supervisor, um, um, who is still her husband now. So, but then she, she got off the good track and became Chancellor of Germany, you know. She sort of tried to wait for the next promotion, but, you know, anyway. Uh, so, this is our, uh, this is, these are the demonstration plants that I talked about in the beginning. So, you can see here all the engineering that we have, uh, that we have, uh, you know, slurry preparation, so we take the feedstock, we grind it with water and pump it around. Here are the reactors and here are uh, product storage things. So these are all real things and they're all coming online within less than 12 months and uh, demonstrate this technology, both the biomass to bio oil and the lignite to lignite oil and black coal uh, to the world on a commercial level. Uh, which then hopefully will lead to adoption. But this is the other thing eh? I said in the beginning. 10% is a better mousetrap. 90% is societal, our societal processes. So I'm showing you the 10%. And we're doing that to see whether society will actually, you know, elect to adopt any of this technology or not. And, and obviously you never know. But as scientists, as engineers, it's our job to offer society choices. And then society decides which choices and where to go, and we can't really influence that. Even though we may feel we have all the answers, or we have the answer, we have the right way to go, we know best, I think that's when one has to take a step back and let the processes of politics, of uh, commercial things, take over. And one can't get too upset about you know, how things go. But I think as scientists and engineers, our job is to give options to the world and then hopefully the world will be clever enough to choose the right ones. Okay, I think that's about it. This is my group, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>